All right, so welcome listeners to the Through the Sight Glass, the podcast that dives deep into the fascinating world of craft beer and celebrates the incredible individuals who shape its vibrant landscape. Join us on a journey where we explore the nuances of this amazing industry and the remarkable people who contribute to its richness and diversity. Today, we've got a guest who's not just a craft beer educator, but an award-winning home brewer and a true titan in the beer industry. Meet Rachel Foytick, a badass mama too with over 11,000 followers on her Instagram over at Beers in Bedtime. From brewing triumphs to industry insights, she spills the hops and barley on all things craft beer. But hold on, this isn't just any beer enthusiast. Rachel's journey includes commandeering the social media realms of not one, but two major Washington State breweries. After growing and engaging with thousands of people through a creative and charismatic style, she took the plunge into entrepreneurship, founding the social media management company, Social Karma Collective. Get ready for an amazing episode as we crack open the first chapter of Through the Sight Glass with a phenomenal Rachel Foytek. Rachel, thanks for coming yeah. on. Thanks for having Appreciate me. Appreciate it. This is fantastic. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thanks for that killer intro. Yeah. <laughs> my, my own words and chat GPT. <laughs> and that will be the way that it goes. Your powers combined. Yes, exactly. But so the way that we uh, usually start the podcast is just kind of asking, like, where you grew up, um, how you grew up, like, siblings and family life, if you're willing to share that. Sure. That's just kind of what we dive into. Yeah. Uh, well, I was born in Tacoma at mm-hmm. St. Joe's um, and then spent some time in Mount Vernon for my real young years and then came back to Tacoma around 10 years old and has have really been here with my siblings ever since. Um, I'm the youngest of four, but then I do, a few years after that, um, my stepbrother was a few years younger. Yeah, okay, gotcha. So, so we're a, uh, kind of a blended family a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, nice. So there's, yeah. 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 And so, uh, so you're you're one out of five. And one, yeah. So really, oh, I'm one yeah. out of five. Nice. Yes. Okay. One out of five. Yeah. A pretty uh, pretty decent sized family. Um, lived all over Tacoma areas and mm. um, went to Mount Tahoma for high school. Oh, rad! And, uh, Shout yeah, out Mount Tahoma. Yeah, Mount, Mount Tahoma and kind of South Tacoma life is where I grew up and um, yeah. Hanging out at Catton's and B&I and uh, probably up to things that I shouldn't be up to and taking the bus all over to <laughs> Tacoma in my high school years. and Yeah. Yeah. Just yep. doing what young kids did you back know, before yeah. the thousands. Back in you the know, day. Where you were allowed to be yeah. when you young were and cell out. And, and yeah. cameras to capture things and yeah. <laughs> living, Lovely. Living free. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. The parenting life, I think, of just, you know. <laughs> earlier kids before the thousands you know yeah. it's like you just like just be be home be home before dark yeah you know yeah well i did have my pager i did <laughs> you had a pager, <laughs> a pager. i sure did that's awesome I had a it was, uh... do you remember your pager number oh, i bet no. you still do it's secret pager i wish i did secret pager i wish i did it was purple see-through though <laughs> oh so you could see all the cool like stuff that's inside. So cool. oh wow but there was th- we all had the codes so sometimes you would like have a code so that you didn't have to call because it was also pay phones Oh, that's so it's like if you weren't at a friend's house, then you had to use a payphone. So it's mm. like there was different codes for different friends. And you'd be like, oh, they're at this house or they're trying to get us to. to Almost like somewhere. communication of like, come over or I'm headed home or. Yeah, except it has to do with numbers like a calculator. I mean, okay. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. So, 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 so it's so like. It's like a one, two, three or 420 or so whatever. Uh, you know? yeah. It's like co- there's little codes and stuff. And then you. Oh, is that why the drug thing. dealers write the pages? Me, so me yeah, yeah. The, yeah. the four, the four twenty was probably an easy oh, code to understand. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Understood. So yeah, so <laughs> growing up young, yeah. all around Tacoma. Yep. Wonderful. Yep. So, so you got to see it really change. What did your, uh, uh, what did your parents do for work? Um, My stepdad worked for Holroyd, um, driving a cement truck. And okay. so that's what he did for 25 plus years. And then my mom was a, um, was a nurse for private practice, uh, doctor's offices okay. and stuff. Yeah. Gotcha. So that's what they did. They're both retired now, still living in Tacoma. Wonderful. Congrats to them. Yeah. Good, good. Thanks. They're just lovely. Good, good. Lovely yeah, humans. well, obviously, if they raise you, you're not, you're not, you are not some hoodlum. Yeah. <laughs> One of those, <laughs> what they call them, like street urchins back then, which I think is a hilarious <laughs> term. Okay, nice. Uh, so well, yeah, I did have a nickname, Ratchet Rachel, for. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh my goodness. But it was a joke. I'm not. No, that's. <laughs> it was like the opposite. It was like you were yeah. ratchet. It's like yeah. I'm not that ratchet, but that's maybe just so a little great. bit. You know. Ratchet. I was born in Tacoma. <laughs> ratchet Rachel, that's so great. It's not who you are, but that's no, no, 
episode. Yeah, lovely. Thanks. Okay, Thanks. awesome. So, uh, working family. Uh, yeah. Five siblings, you know, a yep. little bit blended. Yep. Um, great. So then from there, uh, growing up, obviously, in Tacoma, mm -hmm. running the streets as Ratchet street. Rachel. <laughs> um, what'd you do? Uh, did you go to school? I think that's where this kind of like the conversation leads yeah, yeah. to is just kind of like yeah. college. What was, What did you focus on? Did you go? Does I, it matter? I... I didn't go to call. I didn't know what I wanted to do when I graduated, and um, we didn't. I, we weren't a well-off family, so it wasn't okay. like there was going to be college paid for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I actually I joined the Army Reserves um, my senior year, and then I after I graduated, I had like the summer before I left, and so in October I left for basic training, and then oh wow, but it was reserves, and so I went and did my training. I was down for about a year doing basic training, and then. AIT for combat medic. Oh, um, was the training that I did? Damn. <laughs> yeah, I know. Not know. Ratchet thing. Rachel to war hero. And it's an interesting. It's a whole. I feel like it's a whole another chapter of my life that feels like a, not a part of me to a degree. But it was a. It was an odd decision, and I was very much like a kind of a hippie kid in mm. high school. Um, but I was like, I don't know what I want to do, and my parents don't have money to pay for college and school. And my mom was a nurse, and so I was like, I'll probably do something in the medical field. And, okay. Um, but when I got out, I was like, well, then with what I had that was transferable was an EMT license. Okay. And I was like, I don't – I felt like I probably wouldn't be able to handle that kind of life. Mm -hmm. It's a really – I mean, you would, I'm assuming, probably see people die mm -hmm. on a regular basis and just see some really horrific things, and I – I don't think that I, while I have the stomach for it, like visually to see that kind of thing, uh, the humanitarian side <laughs> would really, I think, eat at me. And the crazy, they have some insane shifts um, yeah. that they do. And so I decided not to do that. I did some school. And then I got sucked into retail while I was going to school and then got promoted to a manager and was making like okay money. And so then okay. I kind of decided not to do school anymore. And then I did that for 13 years was in retail and retail management. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. That I like that bit. Uh, I just want to know. Um, so, one, where did you do uh, like your AIT and basic training at? Basic training was in Missouri in oh, okay. Fort Leonard Wood. It was um, really beautiful when I got there in October. Okay. Because I had never experienced a fall anywhere but here. And mm -hmm. while we have pretty trees, they're mostly pine trees. So over there, it just looked like everything was on fire. It was like mm -hmm. freaking gorgeous. Um, I didn't get to ex experience any kind of city life there, but we were out in the middle of nowhere, mm -hmm. and um, it was really pretty. The winter freaking sucked. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> super cold. Because we're trying to dig holes in frozen ground and sleep out, and do, yeah, when it was literally freezing, and and so that sucked. Um, that's but yeah, so that's where I did that, and then I got to come home for Christmas because it was it timed out for that break, so I was home for two weeks for Christmas, and then I went to. Uh, Fort Sam in um, Fort Sam Houston in um, Texas. In Texas, in San yeah. Antonio. Mm -hmm. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I I just like I was wanting to know the fact because growing up your whole life, you know, in Washington State, then being shipped off to somewhere totally different where yeah, yeah the climate, the weather, East everything. East coast and then down south was it was it was weird, and I was down um, in San Antonio for almost a year, so I I kind of okay. did get to experience like the full. The rain was crazy, the okay. hot weather, the humidity, mm -hmm. the roaches, mm -hmm. yeah. the freaking June bugs, just mm -hmm. nasty stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, The intense. bugs are bigger mm -hmm. in Texas. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I was very happy we to come back home. We call them potato bugs. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And we would dive for each of them and like have them like come at They'll like dive at you and yeah. stuff too. They're Weird. crazy. They're like drunk bugs. Yeah, they like are. Worm. They're kind of dumb. They're a little bumbly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for people that will continue to listen to this podcast, my wife, Jules, who's the other founder <laughs> through the site class, uh, she grew up in Texas. And so when I met her family, went to Texas, and they live in Oklahoma City now as well. Yeah. And yeah, I had never seen he cicadas. Never. The or, rain, the thunder, uh, lightning. Oh yeah. We think we know about that here, and it is so different. different. No, we do have yeah. crazy spiders in the Northwest, but the bugs out there are... Uh, cicadas. cicadas. I'll never forget the. I found one on the sidewalk. Thought it was dead. Picked it up and it started vibrating in my hand and making a noise. Weird. And it freaked me out. And this was I was thirty years old. It, mm -hmm. I was scared. 
And yeah. I would yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, big. my goodness. Yeah. 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 They're actually big. Yeah. That strain thing's interesting. We did that in Alabama, too, yeah. with um, June bugs. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. But what we would do is put like a little whiskey in a glass and oh. put them in there, and you would get the June bug a little bit drunk. Oh they my god! Like, act how drunk. old were you? I mean, like eight, maybe. Okay, okay. All, right, all right. I love that. You put it in there, and then that's a responsible <laughs> age for an Alabama off. kid yeah. to handle whiskey. Is eight years old? That tracks. Yeah, it's like trying to fly, but it can't really fly, and it's like, you know, and you're like holding it around. Yeah. Oh I mean, my it's, gosh! I'm, it's a bad thing to do. You shouldn't do that. I was like, how old were you when you were doing these the mean whiskey. things to, to bugs? Yeah. Oh, like, oh, it's yeah. eight. It's okay. Yeah. I was like thirteen. There's, not okay. There's a lot of bad. There, there's a lot of bad. But it was it yeah. was a formative moment. Yeah, yeah well, thanks, it's, thanks for reminding me. Of it's that. it's all entertainment. I have you know, other weird I will say this is not something we, we condone. You obviously grow out of it. As a kid, yeah. you learn things that you should and shouldn't do to other nice things animal. that you know yeah. you don't know if they have feelings or not. They all have feelings. Yeah. That's just the golden rule. Yeah. They all have feelings. I love it. Yeah. That says the but that yeah, that's so that I one that's something because. I've known you for a little bit. I never knew that you uh, were in the military or anything. So I, I think that's a crazy, yeah. that is, a, that is a, uh, yeah. I say a crazy transition because people are very comfortable here in the Northwest. We have, you know, kind of everything we need. Uh, mm-hmm. All the outdoor activities from ocean to mountains to mountain lakes to desert within like three hour drives. Yeah. So, so many, lucky. many people lucky don't find the need to, I would say, like explore and test themselves. Like, oh, if I'll just right here, I'll be comfortable. So yeah, that's awesome. I do think that we are really lucky, and this is what I will probably always call home for being for the yeah. Pacific Northwest. But, um, but I definitely want to travel so much more. Yeah, where if yeah. you have places to go, it could be in state or out of state. Can you do you have like three to five right off the top of your head that you oh, love to travel man. to? I mean, they're all far away because I've done a million like road trips and things okay. like that. Let's do them. Out but, state. Yeah, I mean, I think like, okay, I'm thinking big. I want to go to like Thailand. Mm-hmm. Um, I really want to go to Cambodia. I think that would be a beautiful place. I want to go through like the temples and stuff and jungles in Cambodia. Oh, awesome. Um, I really want to go. I've been to Czech, but I want to go back to Czech and mm-hmm. I want to go. Um, I didn't get to go to Germany. I want to do some like European travel. I definitely want to go. Yeah, yeah. Some beer, some beers. like mm-hmm. beer train or beer trail. Or yes, something. Yeah. for sure. Yeah, the dream would be to be able to go for a couple of weeks and then have like a rail pass and mm-hmm. kind of hit some different stuff. That, that's been a dream since before I graduated yeah. <laughs> from high school. So, so we'll see. But it's uh, it's tough when you have kids to do the bigger trips. So I think that I have those big things on the horizon. Yeah. For one, when there's time without kids, and two, when there's money to do mm. those things. Yeah. And for now, camping and enjoying everything that we have mm-hmm. locally here is is plenty. It's it's a great, absolutely great thing. Yeah. Mm. What were you doing? I'm sorry, I'm trying to skip. What were you doing for school after you left before you did yeah. retail manager? Um, I was still kind of trying to figure out what I wanted to do, and I didn't, uh, I didn't do the regular, like, career, I wasn't going to do the regular classes. I wanted to take classes that were interesting to mm-hmm. me to sort of figure out some things. Um, so I did a quarter at Pierce, and I took uh, photojournalism, and I took um, the Bible as literature, and I took human sexuality. And oh, I was like, these are all fascinating subjects that I would be happy to learn more about, and maybe one of those will trigger something into a field that I want to go into. Um, and then I couldn't afford the next quarter. Mm-hmm. So then I took that time off. And then I think uh, later that year, I did a quarter at Pierce. But I don't think I did a full load. And I did uh, anthropology as archaeology. Also a fascinating class. Mm-hmm. It was so cool. Honestly, I just want to take classes. Mm-hmm. I just <laughs> I love your school route. I you know. Things that Amazing. you found interesting and cool. That's the way, when people were like, oh, you have to take always, like, prerequisites yeah. of, like, the most boring things. It's like, I just want to get to the stuff I'm interested in. Yeah. Oh, but you have to deal with these boring classes and pass them to get to those. And I understand it from, a, like, a foundation base. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it's like, now we live in a world filled with information technology yes. where it's like, no, only offer the interesting, fun classes, allow people to do them. Yeah. At the leisure, because they're think, paying you. We're yeah, we're paying but I think you. It also kills your curiosity too a bit when you're like, now I have to. T- I'm paying and taking all these classes that don't necessarily have anything to do with the degree. We can go into a whole nother thing because no, you yeah. know whether I want to promote oh, yeah. college to my kids mm. or not. 
is a is absolutely a thing that we're talking about. I just don't know that we are in the environment that a college degree matters that much anymore. Yeah. And that when you have the skill set to do something else, if you want to do a certificate program or you want to do something else, but to be in debt for a four or six year degree for something that really these days just isn't making sense. There are mm -hmm. tracks that you have to do that for. Yeah. But otherwise, there's so many other things that you can do. Yeah. We talk about this a lot, too. It's it's frustrating. And I think I would have done things a lot different. If cr the craft beer movement had been a thing when I was just coming out of high school, and it, it not that it was. Not that it wasn't, but there were, I never saw any women in mm. it at all then. There weren't craft beer brewing programs or anything like that that there yeah. are now. And so it was There wasn't like, Pink Boot Society, no, was, She Brew, any of these things. Even Siebel yeah. probably wasn't, um, I can't remember when Siebel started, but it probably was not open to, or, or at least I, won't, I won't speak on them, yeah, women. it wasn't yeah. targeted towards women. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't, it was never something that I thought was, a possibility. I think that if I was coming out of school now that I probably would have done that sooner. Mm -hmm. I kind of just fell into retail and it was paying enough. And honestly, I absolutely hated it. <laughs> yeah. Retail is a totally different thing. And which is why when I had gone to the tap rooms, I was like, oh, customer service. I don't know. But it's different when you're giving somebody a beer than when people are asking and they're mad that you don't have something in stock. I don't know. It's mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. Well, I, um, I think it's it's like it's such an easy transaction where you give somebody a beer and with all of your experience you're able to navigate to some somebody for something that they exactly want and if you do that with the information that they give you to the best of your knowledge and they're like oh I still don't like this it's just kind of like okay so you either choose something else mm -hmm. or you go yeah whereas people We're not ordering in, people something. in retail <laughs> People in retail, I mean, I remember working at REI, somebody would be mm -hmm. like, do you have this? No, we don't. And typically it was like in a certain size. No, we don't have it in that size. Well, how do I get it? Order it online. Well, I want it right now. What's something comparable? Share that to them. Yeah. I don't want those things. So it's like you go through like 80 questions that yeah. are similar to the first question, and this person Come just to wants to be upset. Yeah. And it's like, I am not the owner of REI. I yeah. cannot whisk this out of the air. I don't do Create buying. it for you. I don't, yeah. 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 You can't be, yeah. I yeah. forgot you. You did have your time too. Oh yeah, it was yeah. always fun. Uh, Sundays at the REI in Tacoma because the church would get out, which was in the same parking lot. Oh, uh, I know about yeah. That if you worked, I worked. Yeah, you do. Okay. Uh -huh. I worked lots of women's wear Sundays, and it was a hectic mess. Uh, yeah, I got my brain battered plenty of times, mm -hmm. and my ego bruised plenty yeah. of times. But it taught me good skills. You get like a couple nice people, and that's like that's nice. Yeah, but it doesn't happen that often. But I think yeah. more importantly is like you just learn you learn how to deal with hard people and you can either let it affect you directly mm -hmm. or you can just be like, listen, this person is not understanding or they're having a bad day and anything that I say and do will not change yeah. that for them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Even if you were to give them exactly what they want, they would still have a bad sure. attitude. They want to feel that way. Um, I will say this happened when I was... 21 to about 25 mm -hmm. so i probably didn't do the best job of facilitating that because i was also <laughs> young and navigating the world and getting yeah. hurt a ton so i was just like yeah different perspective i'm the same as you person yeah. like i'm mad that i cannot <laughs> i wish i could buy more than just oatmeal and chicken to eat all the time but i get paid 12 dollars an hour so this is the <laughs> world that we live in did you ever bring the oatmeal and chicken together i probably should have <laughs> Um, uh, I will say it, it came, it me, came I close and this is something cause this is actually a perfect segue cause we're talking about, um, uh, the skills and things that we learned in retail in a job that wasn't what we got proficient in now, yeah, yeah. which is mm -hmm. beer. Yeah. Um, but All yeah, of those things I up. was, I was nicknamed, mm -hmm. uh, at seven seas brewing, uh, oatmeal kid because that's all I ate all the time because that's all I could afford was oatmeal. And then it was typically chicken and rice. Um, and so, yeah, I was, uh, and Cliff Bars too, shout out to Winco, saved my life. Winco is amazing. I also spent, bulk food at Winco, that saved my life. Oh, wow. yeah. I used to live by. We, we used to get the, um, this is a great little hack if you like hiking. You get the chocolate covered espresso beans, get like a half bag of those, uh, say that they're like chocolate covered raisins or something far cheaper, and then just throw them into your trail mix. 
because you just bite into a little bit of caffeine and yeah, you just yeah. get jazzed up on the hike, just mm -hmm. like pounding chocolate covered espresso coffee beans <laughs> all the time. Yeah, and that is a super ghetto, amazing. <laughs> yeah, that is really, yeah. I, and like, I want to do that immediately. <laughs> yeah. And I, also, who's ever had a freaking trail mix with espresso, espresso beans? Exactly. Chocolate covered espresso beans. Genius. This yeah. you need to scrap this podcast and, and you yeah, just start bagging. Just talk about trail mix win, win, win hack. No, yeah, we'll just have our own bag. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Win cohack. It was amazing. great though. Those those things set me up to be better and successful today somewhere. You know what? Sometimes when you have to live poor, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you really learn so much. I I, mm -hmm. I sometimes I feel sorry for people that grew up with a lot of money and then maybe have to go without a little bit later on in life because you understand how to do it you understand how to do it if you grew up in that way or you've had those periods earlier on in life but like i know how to cut down and i know what i can do and what i have to do but um then you just had it all that's a little tough no i think that's a good yeah. point i think everybody should <laughs> i wouldn't want everybody to grow up poor but you no. you you learn life faster this you, is a good you, segue yeah you learn life faster to y'all's Grocery store days. Oh, grocery! Oh, yes, yeah. is that a good segue? Can we talk about that? I do like that. Well, yeah, because yeah, yeah, we and were this talking goes about on, along with your your badass momery of two. Badass momery of two. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean the budgets are <laughs> probably forever a what thing. Was, what was your thing that you used to do? Is like lo love to be thrifty or something oh, like love that? to be frugal. Okay, so Let's after see. so I'll segue. We'll yeah, do a segue yeah, yeah. of a segue. Well, you got it. When so um, after retail, I well when I was in retail, I got married and then I was pregnant with my first kid. And when I went on to maternity leave, I ended up not going back and um, do my retail job. Well, that's not true. I went back as a part time associate, but gotcha. I was mostly a stay at home mom. And so I was already super big into couponing mm -hmm. and um, the coupon craze. And like, I can't remember what the couponing show. There was there crazy some. couponers or whatever. I was doing all that stuff. I had my binder. Extreme it was spending couponing. hours and hours, yes. but it was like, this is what I can do to contribute. And yeah. like, and I was making, I mean, I wanted to, I wanted to do all this stuff anyways. I was making all of my baby food and I was like doing all the things and we were doing, um, you know, uh, cloth diapers. And it was like all of these things that are going to be sustainable. All that stuff at that time. But also yeah, it was like, that's kind of how I grew up to a degree. We were my mom was a stay-at-home mom. We were super like healthy, and she was making all the stuff and yeah, cloth diapers and all that stuff. And so um, I was like, "This is how I can and I can contribute." And so I got into my blog, loved to be frugal, and posted my my couponing hacks. And I would have like these crazy grocery orders that I spent like five or seven dollars and got fifty to a hundred dollars worth of stuff. And oh wow, yeah. And I was like shampoo and and like body wash, I mean, like all of the toilet beach stuff, toilet, like toilet paper. Because really, like you were like an influencer then before that. As was I said, this is before was before social that media. Didn't exist so then. it was at that like time, um, but you were doing that kind of work though. Facebook That's was cool. there, but there weren't. Yeah, there weren't mm -hmm. like. Oh, well, I don't know. Yeah, well, I, I, I know, will you're say, just the kind of person people want to know what you're up to. And absolutely. They wanna, they wanna, they wanna no, I was excited about sharing new deals. Yeah. So I'm still this way. You're, you're teaching and educating <laughs> and providing an experience, which I think is great because yeah, you've done great with uh, everything you've done in beer, you're and so, so it, kind. it. I think that's funny just to make that arc of being like, yes, it was with coupons. It was with but coupons. But you've yeah. always had that in you to be like, oh yeah, I'm gonna teach people. I want to educate. I get a passion uh, for something, yeah. and then I'm like, ooh, but other people can save, or other people might not know about this beer, or I don't, whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. 100%. Yeah. Okay, so blog, that's interesting. Thanks yeah, for pointing that, so that out, that Walker. Yeah, so that was the blog that I did. Um, and then, yeah, and then I got too busy and all the things. But, uh, but that was great. Y'all need to understand, I'm like a legitimate fan of Rachel. Uh, <laughs> not only is she my partner, but there's like a reason that I wanted I wanted to be around this one. And she's, oh, yeah. Sweet. she's got some, some cool stuff going oh, on yeah. here. So into the grocery store yep. beers. Into the grocery and store beers. Mm -hmm. We do agree with Walker at this point. Yeah, yeah. we're here. Yeah. yeah. There's okay. nobody else. Did you in the hear the? I mean, you heard the intro. I was crying during I the intro. I know you. So. I was like, I can't look at Billy <laughs> because then I'm gonna start getting teary eyed. Yeah. I gotta yeah. say that intro. Though, I know it's cool because that is all that's true about you. That is true. Yeah, hundred percent. You said you said you were like. I mean, 
It's not to share too much, but you were like, this makes me sound way too cool. And it's like, this no, is literally things that you've done. you are that cool. That's who These you are. These are the things that you've done. <laughs> All accurate yeah, depictions exactly. of your life. Yeah. yeah. Well, All right. So, well, well. so from extreme couponing and mm-hmm. being frugal and understanding that like, yeah, I want to show other people how to do this. Yeah, yeah. You've always been teaching. Mom of two kids. Mm-hmm. You basically, I mean, I wouldn't say you put away your career, but you were fully invested in that. Which I think is great. And that was yeah. also, I think, what a lot of, like, you could say, like, the systemic roles were at the time, where it's just like, yeah, you know, husband goes out and works, mm-hmm. mom takes care of the household, and then does everything behind the scenes mm-hmm. to make sure that it runs smoothly. But we're going to talk about grocery be- store beer. I'm so what excited is your, about this. What, is, what was, what was, this was a good too, because it's the segue into, like, how you got into craft beer. Is this a Rachel uh, coined phrase, grocery store beer? No, grocery store beer isn't, yeah. like, isn't a mine. Most people say that. I feel like, I feel like grocery store and gas station beer has been around yeah. for like a long yeah. time. Okay. And maybe you say bottle shop beer and grocery store yeah. beer, but yeah. there's also gas station yeah. beer. Yeah. Yeah. But so if yeah. so, going to the that. grocery store, what beers would you pick out? I would say today. We're not going to go back in time. To, no, yeah, we don't have to because yeah, there's yeah. too, too so many if, things. Yeah. Right now, I have gone through. We've gone through a decent amount of And we kind of really have beers. two categories of grocery store beer, don't we? Or sort of. Except because there's kind of like those cheap lagers and stuff that are like. Well, yes. Okay. Okay. So there's grocery store crafty sort of beer. And we're talking, well, I'll just say my two favorite brands are would be Frame and Georgetown yeah. for grocery store oh, beers. Oh, heck yeah. For, and that would be like, those are, those are craft Mm-hmm. Beer places, but they're available. Yeah, in, legitimate but it's, beers, yeah. though. They taste, they taste good. But yeah, yeah, they're pretty tasty. So, yeah, yeah Frame Pilsner okay. is almost always in the fridge. Mm-hmm. And then it's either Johnny Utah or we're trying Oh, out. that Hazy Pale? The Hazy Pale. Nice. Yeah. Well, well yeah, I'm the, trying to find, if I can find something that I like better than Johnny Utah. Because mm-hmm. what I really want is I love that low gravity Hazy. Mm-hmm. It's my mm-hmm. favorite thing. Like a five something hazy. Yeah, mm-hmm. but it's but it's hard to find in a grocery store variety. They're all pretty malty. True. The True. the attention to keeping things cold stored, I think, is a little bit different, and the shelf life is different. And I don't I don't know. I think uh, sometimes we've had some hits and misses. I feel like this Johnny Utah is like stomping ass though. Like it's it's, it's tasty. really hard to get. Yeah. Better than it to twelve ninety nine. I think I like yeah. that even more than Bodie, but we'll get some Bodie right sometimes here. too. I'm like, yeah, I don't for nothing else. Bodie. I like that. Mm-hmm. That's a good radio. Bodie sometimes too. on yeah. sale for ten ninety nine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Love You're it. like, we'll take two. Yeah. 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 No, but that is true. <laughs> and I have a coupon. <laughs> <laughs> and I have. A, I wish I had a coupon. But those know. two beers, they're so yeah. drinkable too. Like you can have a couple of those, and it's you know you feel just fine. Yeah, it's nice to have. Yeah, I think that the routine has kind of changed a little bit, and I think a lot of people are keeping an eye on their budgets, and I know that I'm spending a couple hundred dollars more a month on groceries than I was a couple years ago, Yeah, sure. and so it's like, damn, to, to drink all craft beer, that's what I, I mean, this is still craft beer, to drink yeah. all um, bottle shop beer, and I mean, really, like, that's like two cases a month. It, or it's probably even more than that. I was yeah, getting yeah. two cases a month, usually for myself, and that would be, well, I don't, I mean, I could probably actually do the math, but one to two beers a night kind of thing. Yeah. And No, it gets expensive. And I it's, mean, yeah. you want to support uh, your local bottle shop. Absolutely. And they're, you know, they're, they're making margins, but sometimes it's not even that big. But yeah, just like the price to come home, like, if you buy a six pack of cans mm-hmm. from our favorite local Peaks and Pints, they do a great job. But still, yep. that's probably going to run you like thirty five, forty dollars. Yeah, you know, it um, is. We just got a six pack. It was about thirty six yeah. bucks. And in my head, I was like, "That's a pretty good deal." Because <laughs> yeah. I'm used to getting a case at a time. I was like, "That's not." And then he was like, "Yeah, but a six pack. We're buying a six pack for like ten ninety nine to twelve ninety nine. It's twelve ounce cans." I don't, you know. But you know, yeah. I feel like it's at that point though. Like when you compare, like even the really good grocery store beer to our favorite stuff that we get at Peaks mm-hmm. and Pints, I don't even think about it as the same beverage anymore. Like it's a different, it's mm-hmm. a different level. Yeah, I can and, see that. And even yeah. and the same thing, like with like Freeman and Georgetown, they have mm-hmm. higher level stuff that they do too. I mean, that too, yeah, you know, it's. But uh, you you should talk about kind of that routine that we have where we're doing like we have a kind of 
hear the gracious Lord Jesus put in with mm-hmm. a lot of soft ones. I want to hear that. Oh, well, you're talking about... Because I feel like this is a good hack, too. And, I, I mean, this enhanced my life. Oh. I'm, ex- I'm excited about it. What are you talking about? Are I'm you talking, talking about the, the shootout? You should tell them about it. What, what? When we sampled them? Well, no, but the use in bedtime routine that we got going on with what grows we do, you know? And to figure out which ones? Well, we got the grocery store ones, and then we got the, the ones that are kind of cool. So then we can have, like, a uh, one or two yeah, fancy yeah. ones to share, and then we can switch over to But the shootout's cool, too. Both but the shootout's fun. cool. We t- yeah, there is a cool shootout. We, yes. Well, it's nice to have these so that we can have one with dinner, and then, like, you know, sometimes you do want another one, and you're like, well, I don't want to waste all of the good beer. It is nice to have, a, like, one or two good ones and then kind of switch oh, yeah. to something that's a little cheaper. Yeah. And I think... We all are like, mm, yeah. that's a, a good way to um, stretch the dollar. Oh, 100%. And on top of that, maybe everyone should do a blind shootout with some of their go-to kind of super cheap beers. Mm-hmm. We're talking oh, okay. Bud Light, Coors Banquet, Rainier, that kind of stuff. But uh, we, which did a, we did. Which we did. We did a little shootout with Banquet and Rainier and Heidelberg. I think yeah. I put Sapporo, Sapporo. in there. It was there. Sapporo. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Random like yeah. that. Yeah. My, was it both of ours? So how'd that, how'd that shoot out land different. for y'all? Yeah, yeah. Tell, tell me how it landed. My, my, I landed, well, I think that maybe it should be the well, you should surprise. Talk about, we had expectations going into it. We did have expectations. And it didn't end up like we thought it was going to. But I think that I did think I was going to like the one that I liked. Uh, yeah, because you know. I my my <laughs> winner. I thought my winner was maybe going to be Rainier or Heidelberg, and it was one hundred percent Heidelberg. And I think that I realized I kind of stole it. Oh. And that makes me feel bad. <laughs> no, that's okay. It makes it me feel happened. bad because I know that there's such a cult following, and I'm like, yeah, I'll drink some Rainier. I don't want to drink Bud Light ever. Also, I'm really sorry, you guys. Coors Banquet was like. Bleh. <laughs> Oh, uh, that's getting, okay. Here's it was the sad the thing. Worst. Coors Banquet was my favorite one going into this. And then that whole stupid Karate Kid thing. That guy is drinking the Coors Banquet, and I felt like a real kindred spirit with Johnny over that. And this just screwed up everything <laughs> for me. What was your shootout? Well, the, we had the same one. The, we yeah, we were part of the same one. And so I thought, I was really coming into this. I was like, you don't have any respect for Coors Banquet. Coors Banquet is the best, like, mass produced. You can buy 30 of them. It was not. Yeah. Well, I think that I think we it wasn't. do know that it was not. Like yeah. I think like it's okay. Like obviously, if we were offered a frame or something, sure. and then yeah. there was like we would, but like there's times that we do like the nice stuff, and it's like we're just gonna we're just we're not gonna waste the like the nice stuff. We're gonna just gonna have Absolutely. the whatever. So yeah. it's like. We know. There's a time and a place for all There's of it. There's a time and a place. When you're camping and you're doing barbecues yeah. and you're floating yep. down a river. Yeah. But, oh, but yeah. for sure, yeah. though, I yeah. ended up picking Rainier and you ended up picking Heidelberg. And we both knew the Heidelberg, Heidelberg was the Heidelberg was distinctive out of all of it. It was distinctively sure. fresher and it was so much more craft. But I didn't originally place it that way. Yeah. And I did, I absolutely, I was like, yeah, I would much rather have, like, a bunch of Heidelbergs than Rainier. Mm. And it's not that expensive. It makes no. me proud, though. I'm and happy. I was like, good job. Yeah. Good job, <laughs> Seven Seas, yeah. for making some great I think, Heidelberg. I think that is, we just can't get it, like, because we've been in Oregon for a while. We can't find it there. And so we have been, yeah. we, we go with that. So maybe we're here for a few months. Yeah. No, I think that is a big thing, though, is that, you know, <clears throat> there's a large majority of drinkers that like to drink, you know, the big macro lagers, and they're looking for something like that in mm-hmm. their craft brewery. Yeah. And honestly, it's I wouldn't say that it's better because it's all distinctive on people's face, but you can just tell that there is a difference. I mean, and I would say, yeah. like, I think Rainier, there's slight differences, but it tastes really similar to Coors mm-hmm. Banquet, as Coors Banquet it takes, tastes really similar to, you know, Miller High Life and other beers. Mm-hmm. And there are people that will fight me all up and down today about that. Yeah. That's fine. But the end of the day is like it is a macro, usually corn yeah. lager that is just like easy drinking. Um, and cheap then when a crap, the wallet. Yeah, yep. it's cheap on the wallet. And sometimes a little nostalgic. And sometimes mm-hmm. it's that's not even based sometimes. off of taste at all. And I think that's what like, it's supposed to do. Yeah. It's because everybody's mm-hmm. dad, that's what they drank before craft breweries yeah. were popular. Even if you're, yeah. you were lucky if your dad was like drinking like, you know, like Dale's Pale Ale or Hale's yeah. Ales yeah. or Wheat Pete's Wicked crafty. Brown. Yeah. yeah. Dale's oh. is not. No. 
not so bad. Yeah. Yeah. So it was like you were lucky if you had a dad that did that or homebrewed, but otherwise yeah. it was usually like those garage beers that you see on like that '70s show or Home Improvement. It was probably you know. That's why nice. I put Sapporo in there though, because yeah. I wanted to see did I really like Sapporo <laughs> or did I really like my Japanese home. Yeah, no, and it right, turned yeah, out yeah. I really liked my Japanese. <laughs> yeah, like, that's so what it yeah. was. Yeah. That was my least favorite yeah. of all mm-hmm. the beers, and I felt like, nah, this beer is too much. It's way better than this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. Nope. Mm-hmm. I was dead wrong. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But no, so I'm really glad caramel. you brought up Heidelberg. I know, yeah, yeah. I know. We've this is I I really enjoyed this conversation. I'm just steering the Willy Wonka boat. Um, <laughs> So Heidelberg is brewed by Seven Seas Brewing, and that's mm-hmm. where we met. I had known that you is. online and known you in the beer scene in Tacoma for a little bit. But uh, do you mind talking about, like, how you got into craft beer and then kind of what led into your roles of, like, yeah. beer tending and then social media? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so basically, I had gotten into craft beer. I thought I didn't like beer until I was 21. Funny how that Cause works. Because it's funny how that works, right? Because you yeah. only have, like, so much that you're offered, and it's all pretty yeah. shitty. I just want to drink MJD yeah, like, all the time. <laughs> so really, like, in those days, it was, like, Thanite Special Brew was, like, my my fizzy, fruity drink. It was, yeah, it really Understandable. It was, yeah. Ratchet I, Rachel, I, I remember, for a reason. My roommate, Marie, had Hornsby's cider, oh, yeah. and that's what I would mm. drink all the time. See, Hornsby's and the cider things didn't happen until just... Like a tiny bit after I had turned twenty one. Yeah. And so then, it, so yeah, so I drank some of the ciders and some like the hard lemonade kind of stuff. But um, but I was like, ooh, there's these ambers that I'm liking, and oh, nice. Fat Tire and Alaskan Amber. Um, those were like really like my gateway beers, and I was like, oh, mm. nice. This is so much more flavorful than like a than a Bud Light. Like I really was like, this is just this is beer. That was my whole experience with beer in general, and so. Um, so, and then that led to pale ales and stuff like that. And I had, I felt like I was a, a high level grocery store beer person, <laughs> basically, <laughs> you know, I was like, okay, well I have a, I have a keen sense for some beer, but I wasn't experienced in like beyond that, a super crafty kind of yeah. styles. Um, but I had gotten more and more into it. And then when I was getting, well, before I'd gotten divorced, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I had a beer brewing kit that was on our Christmas wish list that was actually purchased with my ex-husband in mind, and they thought that they were buying it for him, but it was the item that I had put on there. They just assumed oh. they just assumed that That's it was great. the guy who that wanted that. that. <laughs> and I was so ecstatic mm-hmm. to get it, and just, like, it blew my mind. So I got that kit. It was, like, a Northern Brewer kit. It was, it was like, $120 or something, goes, and it comes with your first... Like homebrew, all the ingredients for your first homebrew, mm-hmm. and um, all, it's like all per, extract. It's, yeah, as I was gonna say, it's like pretty simple. It's like yeah. pale grain and yeah, extract. It's a, it's a lot of cooking and a little bit of science. Is kind of yeah. what it is. But um, but I had gotten that, and then I got onto this homebrewing forum, and I like watched and like studied and watched everybody's questions and what they were asking and all of these infections and all the stuff, and I'd be like, oh, and then I would ask questions, and I was uh, reading how to brew, and I wanted to, like, do all the research before I, like, really, like, embarked, and so it was, it was about two months later that I brewed my first batch, and then obviously had to wait weeks later mm-hmm. and do the whole bottle, you know, wait, wait for it to uh, carbonate. Was and... that surprising to you? Did you think that it would just happen, like, within a few days? No, I mean... I'm not, was... I'm not trying to be naive, because no, no. when I, like, just even washing kegs when I got into it, I thought beer would just happen so quickly, and like, I was like, oh, yeah, this will be ready in, like, three days. Uh, yeah. yeah. I think that I I probably was surprised, but since I had super researched it before I'd ever yeah. done, I was like, You'd at done that the point, work. I was like, okay, all right, this is what it's going to be, and, you know, at the end of that result, I was like, this is a pretty drinkable amber is what it came with. I don't drink ambers really anymore, but this is pretty kind of okay. Nice. So it turned out somewhat a success? Yeah, I mean, it turned out very drinkable. drinkable. <laughs> it turned out very drinkable. So successful, eh. No, th- that's why I say <laughs> that it. successful. I think, I think, I think everybody yeah. is like first homebrew. They, you have such high expectations for it. Yeah. It usually falls very short, but then you were just like, can we drink this whole thing? And I think that's where you really divide the line of like what's drinkable or not. Yeah, yeah. I think that my I think that because I followed that forum and I saw all of those infections and all of the things, I was like, this is a little harder, and I am gonna have a a shit ton of 
attention to detail mm-hmm. on this. But that's what you're so good at. <laughs> like, naturally, though, like, that I is do, how your brain works. I do, like, things yeah. clean and categorized. Just thinking about, like, living with this woman, like, she has a way to do things. I do have a way to do things. And mm-hmm. I've found a I way a, to do I things. I got a system for that. But yeah. the systems, they're better systems. I, I have adopted these systems. No, yeah. I, they're thought-out <laughs> systems. I So I did, uh, I think I did another... 10 batches on my own. I think so I did. The, so the fire was ignited. The for fire was ignited. Like wanting to figure out more and learn more and practice more. Yeah. I Wonderful. really, I was really enjoying it. I think being a woman that came from being a stay at home mom that kind of felt a little secluded and is kind of naturally maybe not super social, which I think a lot of people yeah. maybe that follow me online <clears throat> or even people that are in my life now probably think that I'm much more ex- extroverted than I am. I'm okay. very much an introvert. And um, so being a stay-at-home mom, I, like, self-isolated, not intentionally, but I was, like, it was nice to have something that was really my own that my partner wasn't interested in at all and that was solely mine. And from start to finish, I had to figure it all out, and it felt like a really cool achievement. I think that motivated me oh, awesome. even more. It so just felt cool. really, like... It felt like it was all mine, and I could do this from scratch. And look at me. I made this beer, and it was really like a um, a, um, confidence boost, I think, in my life. Like I feel like empowering. It was very empowering. Yeah. Yeah. And it felt, I mean, to some degree, and things shouldn't be men dominant and women dominant. I think that, obviously, as a world, we're trying to get away from that, but... I think that as a kid, I was always kind of trying to keep up with my brothers and that it was like, like I wanted to do things that weren't like girl focused because I saw a different type of, I don't know, I just, I wanted to be able to prove that I could do that. And so it felt even cooler maybe, especially at that time, to be a woman in home brewing. And then when I had started doing that, I was like, well, I'm going to, I have all this beer stuff that I want to talk about and that I want to take pictures of and share and I don't know, I had no one else in my life that was brewing, and I didn't know even beer-focused people. I was the beer-focused person, and so... Like in your friend group? In my friend group and my family. Yeah, you. yeah. So, so for me, I was like, that's when I started the Instagram. And I was like, well, I'm going to start this Instagram for beers and bedtime, and it was like, I'm a mom, and I'm drinking my beers after the kids' bedtime, but I want to share also my home-brewing things. And I think, um, you know... Probably, and maybe I don't like to admit it, but me being a girl, you know, a woman, I should say, me being a woman in that position, I think it definitely did get me more attention because so many men that are home brewers are somewhat of an older age, or at least when I had first started my account, um, somewhat of an older age and male dominated, even still, I think that we can all oh, agree yeah. that it's the brewing world still is very yeah. male dominated. Yeah. White male dominated is the correct way to put it. Yeah. I think that seeing someone that's interested in beer, I think a lot of people want to push back and they want to know, especially if you're a woman, do you actually care anything about the beer? Do you know about the beer? And There's it's, gatekeeping to it. Yeah. They, they test your knowledge for sure to be like, are you just, I won't say bandwagon, but it's like, oh, do you just like beer mm-hmm. and you just spout things that you heard? Yeah. Which is very not inclusive. It's very not inclusive. Yeah. And it is a frustrating Thing, but I felt like um, I felt like me home brewing kind of like uh, navigated that differently. It's like, oh, if you're brewing your own beer, then you obviously know something, and which which I do. But that doesn't mean that other women don't. If you're drinking beer mm-hmm. and you enjoy beer and you have a whole account that's about beer, mm-hmm. you probably really mm-hmm. like beer. What yeah. <laughs> what is that? Yeah, I would say I, I like the name. Um, I hadn't heard the story of how you got your name or, like, why you chose it, which I think is brilliant. The, like, mm-hmm. really putting the kids to bed and then you have the time to create, drink beer, talk about mm-hmm. it, and make it. I think that's lovely. But um, also, yeah, um, so just a quick question. Mm-hmm. When you started your account, do you remember, like, what year that you really started posting on social media? That's okay. I forget I, and then I have to scroll back. I I'm- no, it's it's totally fine. If you need a chance, because I'm just thinking about. So when I started, I 2015 is when I started working at Seven Seas mm-hmm. and REI, and that's when I really got. I was drinking craft beer before that, but a lot of it was from Seven Seas, the Gig Harbor Tap Room, 
and then like Nero's Brewing, and then like mm-hmm. Pint Defiance. Pint Defiance taught me a lot. That will yeah. always be like the place where I feel like I once I like learn my chops. So, like people, you know, people that were bartending at Pint Defiance, I would be wanting to drink like Session IPA is really big. Mm-hmm. I love Session IPAs. I know it's just a hoppy pale or whatever people want to yeah. joke and make fun of. Um, Seven Seas did uh, the Life Jacket Session IPA. Yep. Which I love. I forgot about that. Loved I don't know it. How I forgot. We used yeah. we used like a lot of that citra in it. Yeah. It was like five it and a half percent. Citrusy. Yeah. It was so much fun. But um yeah. they were the people that uh the bartenders would be like That was our band beer for a while. The life, life jacket. jacket. When when Kate used to work oh, over yeah, there. I love that. Yeah. Neil yep. would come over with a growler and that would be the band That's practice. Fantastic. I love how these circles watch in that because <laughs> yeah, I work with I Justin. I know Neil really well too. Mm-hmm. Oh that's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Neil yeah. was my old drummer in that band. Oh, okay. But um, awesome yeah, they would um, they would always suggest to me being like, <laughs> the wildest stuff like RJ or uh, Justin Johnson or they call him JJ. They yeah, uh, they'd be like, try an oud brewing, like uh, try a Belgian quad, like try this, and it was so out of the range of what I was comfortable yeah. with well, drinking. Yeah, but I will say it made <laughs> me. Quad. Yeah. It's so yeah. different than a. Yeah. Yeah. It did, it, but it was it was so interesting, and it kept me so so intrigued about it. So when I yeah. was washing kegs at Seven Seas, I mean, I literally was in there washing kegs, but then just reading beer history books about every single beer style that I could. Keg master. Yeah, keg lord. Keg lord. I, I do. Yeah, no, it's that. okay. Keg master is good too. Keg lord is cooler yeah. though. I still have my Seven Seas growler. The one year that uh, we were able to put like custom inscriptions on it, he was like. Mike running was like, what do you want? And I was like, keg lord. And yeah. He was like, why? And I was like, dude, for a year and a half, I washed about 120 kegs a I day. I earned that title. Five days a week. <laughs> Hell yeah. I was like, yeah, dude, it's it's fine. And but he, um, yeah. And he did not deny you. No, no. he didn't. I have it. It's in the yeah, storage. I'm glad because I almost. I made him keep it. He was yeah. moving from Tacoma to go I made her that keep her funny. Yeah. Because I was like, oh. And I was like, maybe Where I can keep put one. Yeah. I was like, you think I'm just gonna keep one, and I have two, one. but yeah. but so so <laughs> that that yep. coming back to the point of like yeah, uh, yeah. starting in 2015 uh, was when I got into craft beer, and I believe you were probably doing your social I, media right around that time. I think before 2015 it. is because I think that I started at Seven Seas in January of 2017. Okay, I, I believe I could be off by one year, and I think that I had had my beers and bedtime account for about two years before that, which means that I was home brewing a little bit before two years before okay, gotcha. that. So you, right yeah. around that time, it was mm-hmm. probably been home brewing for three years. I know 2016 is when we got the Tacoma location. And I know you were in Gig Harbor, so I know you started in Gig Harbor, but mm-hmm. I think I met you for the first time in mm-hmm. the Tacoma location because you guys yeah. were doing the weird kind of slip swap schedule where yeah. Gig Harbor people would help Tacoma and then the Tacoma crew would go to Gig Harbor yeah. To kind of uh, fit out scheduling. Yeah, we did some flip flopping, but I really, I really enjoyed that. My thing, for the most part, once I got kind of settled in with that schedule at both tap rooms, was that I was only over there on Mondays. But I loved it because being in Gig Harbor, there was a little bit of a separation between what was being brewed, and yeah. and so then I got to talk to you guys. Yeah. And be like, ooh, what's what's brew? I can what I can smell you guys brewing something right now. You guys yeah. just out of the hops. What's What's going on? What are the hops that are in there? And what yep. is going to be coming out? And is this just another batch of like a regular stuff or is it something like special that's coming yeah. out? And that was super fun for me. So I was I like, I don't mind. That. I did. Mm-hmm. I was like, I'm not making as good of money on a Monday over here, but it was worth it for me to do the commute and take a bridge mm-hmm. toll so yeah. that I could get be kind of more involved in some of that stuff. Yeah, which I think you were already adamant in. I mean, I remember you talking with, uh, management and wanting to do beer tours, wanting mm-hmm. to get people involved. Um, and this is also just like a nice little transition because your page has continued to blow up or was exploded uh, at the at the point as well at Seven Seas. I mean, people mm-hmm. knew you. People would come up to you and say, oh, your beer's in bedtime. They wouldn't call you Rachel. No. <laughs> so no. I know that from staff members, and I remember listening to customers actually saying that. Um, and that I think that's great too because I think that just shows that like through all of your hard work, dedication, engagement, think people for when they think of like beer educators, and you can even say the word beer influencer, but they think it's all just like, oh yeah, this is like a gimmick. They just like regurgitate information. 
Um, I'm saying this from like what I was around the people at my time. I'm not saying this is how I thought. Uh, but I think that was the first time for me where I was just like, no, like this person knows what they're talking about. They actively practice. I'm not saying you need to actively brew, but you care about it. Yeah. Like you give a lot of intention and you give a lot of passion into it. And that's what makes it important. Mm -hmm. And it's not just like, oh, hey, I'm here on here. I do kitschy stuff. I have a pretty face. Like you do a really good job of presenting yourself as professional. And I think that was just one thing that when I was working at Seven Seas, watching you work the tap room um, and bartend and stuff and like listening to people talk, you were always super professional. And I was like, man, if they were willing to sit down and have a 15, 20 minute conversation with you about like, developing a brew recipe or like what's your mashing process like you would blow their socks out of the water and so that's just giving kudos to you but also like that was like the you know i think that's also hard and i think that's maybe what i'm leading into is like maybe talk a little bit about that time of you were beer tending you had a really big instagram page and it still is big it's still going and so just like what was the balance like of that of you know like being in the tap room uh loving and enjoying what you do but at the same time trying to do something more and maybe being limited um yeah just expand on that i think um mm, well i'll rewind a tiny bit yeah do you think when i when i was looking for work from being a stay-at-home mom and i was like okay now i am getting a divorce (laughs) and i need to find something and i knew that i didn't want to go back into retail i was like this is i had a lot of people that discouraged me from getting into beer and they were like I think that they were worried about it not being steady and not being profitable which is true (laughs) everybody (laughs) was saying that we all got suckered in that (laughs) but I was also like this is my chance to follow something that's a passion of mine and to really like love what I'm doing and um, when I applied at seven seas I was like I will do I wasn't applying for the tap room but I was like I'll do whatever I'll like I'll clean up the... I Really, I was kind of wanting to be on the brewing side. I think that it... I did know that from the beginning. Yeah. I think that... Tra- Travis talked to us. He was like, we have a girl, Rachel, that wants to be back here. And um, I won't speak for everybody, but I will say that all the brew crew was like, yeah, if they want to do the work, come back here. Mm-hmm. Be stinky with us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was like, I am... I will get into all the tanks, and I will do all the things, and I will scrub, and I'll do all that stuff, and... I was much more worried about being on the face side, face side of things because of uh-huh. customer service and retail. Um, but when, but I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how things would have been if that had yeah. been my entry in. I wouldn't have made enough money. I wouldn't have to be able to support myself and two kids for sure, because it was it was barely enough, it was yeah. barely enough with tips and stuff to be on the other side. So it probably kind of worked out better in a way. Because mm-hmm. then it was able to, I was able to stay in it for longer. Yeah, um, I see. With with being able to meet ends. Yeah, <laughs> and being able, and I really also appreciated that. Um, you know, we did the craft beer server, like we, you know, we did some of those things at Seven Seas, and we did tasting sheets, and we talked a lot about tasting notes, and we did beer sensory, and all I of those things. The beer sensory. Yeah, that yeah, I think that that was an amazing thing to be able to be part of. I'm so glad that I was able to do that stuff, even on the um, beer tending side, and getting to pick a beer for someone that's like maybe they don't know what they want, or like they like something that's kind of more mainstream, and like here I'm picking something for them. Yeah. Then, like all of that felt so like satisfying and rewarding. Yeah. You were one of the key factors in uh, in Seven Seas for doing like the tasting panel. We were previously talking about how you really enjoyed being able to put together like your knowledge and also your you know like your palate to guiding people to the drinks or bevies that they wanted, and then that's something that you brought up. I was at Seven Seas at that time where I do remember where Travis, our head brewer, came by and said, "Hey, like we have a couple of taproom staff, Rachel being a prominent one of wanting to run a tasting panel." Um, that was great from a production standpoint because it's like, yes, we should be tasting every beer that we can. Um, when I 
I've gone on to work at plenty of breweries, and we would typically, every beer that we package, we'd keep one in the cooler, like a, a pack of it, like a six-pack, and then we'd put the other six-pack in a warm temperature room, usually 60 degrees or higher, and that's what you would taste within like a month to three-month period. So you could see what the difference was between recipe development, uh, DO levels. It's great for any, if you're a brewery business, you need to start tracking these things. I thought that was really powerful and awesome that that was like one of the first things that you did after getting comfortable in the tap room and you became a, like a lead uh, server, I think, uh, pretty quickly um, because you were eager. You wanted to work in the brewery, so they're like, we're going to use this girl for all that she knows. So if briefly, if you want to expand on that because it leads into how you started running uh, or how you got started into social media management beyond your own page. Sure. I um, I super loved talking to the customers about beer and learning more about specific beer ingredients and different hops and uh, malts and stuff that we're using. But I think that um, doing something from a sensory standpoint has always been fascinating to me. And um, being in a brewery that um, was at that time getting into grocery stores and and obviously canning a ton and you're worried about um, shelf life and stability and stuff like that. I think that uh, all of those things have always been fascinating to me. They still continue to be fascinating to me. Um, and I think that being able to be a, for them to get that set up um, and to be able to be a part of that from the sensory standpoint and be able to fill out the sheets and kind of talk, do like a round table about what it was that we were tasting and, and how things are, um, you know, falling off maybe too soon or other things are lasting better than we thought, wh whatever that was. Um, I think that it's really cool. Also, just training. So many of the things that we do in beer are visual and kind of taking that away and sometimes not knowing what beer it was. You really are training your palate a, a lot more and on such a more detailed level when you – don't know what beer it is and you're trying to figure out what it is and you're trying to think is this a fresh beer are these are these desirable things are what's undesirable with not even knowing what category it might be in yeah um some of those things were weird i think that we tried like a balls deep that was really well that's not that's the, the double ipa now yeah, yeah. that was a really really old and hot one and we were i was like is this like a weird oxidized barley wine or like what yeah. the hell is this and you don't sometimes you don't know what category something is and it's also i think fascinating to know that that's what a double ipa can be like when it's been hot for six plus months you know yeah it's like these are the things that hop character is gonna like fall off and it's gonna be even more malty and like you know whether it's boozy or not you can have a have a really smooth barley wine and you can have an extremely boozy double IPA and yeah. you know, then there's these weird things in between. And so to kind of see like, this is how this thing turns pruny or that, you know, these are things that I associate with different types of beers, but this is the natural evolution yeah. of that beer is like a really, cool, I love like the science behind that stuff. And I think that it's like a, it's a cool challenge yeah. to yourself and your palate. I think I learned a lot. I would, I would being agree. In that process. I think one thing that when when I've learned about, you know, doing, they call it R&D, but like tasting and drinking beer over the years, it's so much like your, your I'm going to mess this word up, I think it's olefer, olfactory, mm -hmm. but like the way that you smell, it ties into like emotions and things in your brain. Mm -hmm. This is a very dumb way Nostalgic to put it. I'm not going to get into the beer theory or beer jargon about it, but it really does. So a lot of people, when they taste things in beer... It's going to remind them of like a memory and a smell that they had. Mm -hmm. And until you pinpoint that down, and I can think of uh, one specifically. Uh, my first one was when I went to Pint Defiance really drunk, and I had a Session IPA. RJ gave it to me. It's from Green Flash, and it tasted like butter popcorn. And I thought it I thought it was the most amazing thing ever. But the reason was is because I didn't know at that time that you yeah. know diastole in beer is bad. Yeah. But I was sitting there not really caring or thinking about the beer I was drinking and then went to a craft beer bar where somebody mm -hmm. served me a beer and I literally exclaimed, I was like, dude, this tastes just like buttered popcorn. 
and RJ's face went white. Him and Barry removed it immediately. But I was, I was, I was so, I was so excited about it because for me, like the things, and it made me more curious. Yeah. And I think that's one thing that you did a good job because when we would do tastings, um, and so I we brushed over this briefly, but so Rachel and I, uh, Rachel and I, kind of overlapped times working at Seven Seas. I worked production, she worked tap room. And we'll get into this, but eventually moved into uh, like lead server and social media management for Seven Seas. But we would consistently talk about beer. And when we would have beer panels with the brewers, we were always encouraged to bring taproom servers on and to talk about it. And I wasn't the only person. I mean, Chris worked there as well, mm-hmm. who we'll bring on the podcast. But we were like, Rachel is ab- like, she's a BJCP judge. She's Cicerone certified. We were like, she should be on this panel to teach the taproom staff because brewery staff only have so much time to teach taproom mm-hmm. staff. We have taproom servers that are educated to do so. That is way better for the company. And that was something that I found profound that you were able to break down uh, smells and like what you tasted and it clicks in people's brain. And that's always the hardest thing is because plenty of brewers will have a smell or a taste that they can't quite place, and it just takes one person to give the right word where it clicks for a memory, or it clicks for something, and then it forever is like, oh my goodness, now I can identify that. It is no longer this like kind of an ambiguous mystery smell. And you always did a really good job of that. And so when you were when you were leading a team, and this was in the point when the I think the like you could say QAQC, but like tasting program was going on with Seven Seas. It's when my when Jules, my wife, she started tap room managing, managing and started being on those panels mm-hmm. and understanding and learning more. And that was one thing I think. I'm so glad you were there with another girl. Yeah. it was so nice having. I know it was you and me. Yeah, yeah. It was the cookie. It's time to yeah, go yeah. down. Yeah. yeah. It, I, I, it was super helpful because it was very common. And I think this is very common is that a lot of tap room servers, even if you didn't care about beer, you basically learn three words to describe, you know, whatever, whatever style or name of the beer was on tap. Mm-hmm. You know, I know like rude parrot, everybody would say like it's citrusy, it has tangerine in it. It's a little bit bitter. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. you know, like for most people like that gets by, but if somebody is like, tell me a little bit more about it. Unless you know more about it, you, you're just kind of like, uh, what? And I think that's kind of what propelled you into a role at Seven Seas is that they saw not only that you had ambition in learning more about beer, but maybe this is my conjecture, that you had more ambition to learn more about beer and to do more at Seven Seas. Mm-hmm. I will say we definitely didn't have a role back there. Um, this was at the point where uh, we were having people quit and they were firing people, and so the back of the house uh, for the brewery side was uh, looking very bleak. For yes. uh, another reason why it ended up being a good thing that I landed on the tap room yes. side, I suppose. But which you you yeah. so far excelled at, and I will say this: um, there's plenty of us that were like for the pilot system because mm-hmm. when you were out at Tacoma, the pilot system was back in Cook Harbor, mm-hmm. and for a while we ran a program where the servers and people could talk about a beer style they wanted to do, and they, like, brew it on the pilot system. I know Chris ran that system for a while. Yeah. That was a fun but short-lived program, which I wish. I wished. was so bummed because that was a program that was on when I was there. Uh-huh. And it was just – and it was, like, kind of, like, by seniority. And so I knew oh, that it was okay. going to be a while until it was my turn, and then that program kind of ended before that. Yeah. And I was like, oh, my God, this would be – incredible i loved Mm. that they had that and then sadly i just didn't get that so i think this is a good sign for any breweries that will listen to this podcast for many episodes to come listen to this one and keep a uh like a you could say like employee staff suggestion box to brew a beer and have them come along and be a part of the process community loves it staff loves it it's it's well it's worth a great it learning experience for everyone and why would you not want someone that's in your tap room to be more involved and so excited about a beer that you brewed yeah and be like i helped brew it i helped come up with this recipe or the idea mm-hmm. for it and then they understand all of the brewing process i think anyone that get that halfway enjoys beer that gets a chance to see the brewing process from start to finish is going to make them appreciate drinking beer even more. Absolutely. Me, 
home brewing and realizing the quality of beer that I was going to make, like at the end of the day, whether it was, you know, pretty drinkable or not, mm-hmm. it has given me so much more appreciation and, um, I don't know, to be like, this absolutely is an art form and it's its own like creative expression and brewers are artists and um, there is a vi- there is a craftsmanship to mm. craft beer um, that not everyone can achieve. Mm-hmm. It is a it's a artistic. Uh, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, expression. I think about like all of the pilsners that we've had, mm. and like you can actually mess up a pilsner. <laughs> Bet a lot. A lot. A lot. And yeah. like it, it it is amazing that like you know, you can just like. Pick up a. We just like know a good pilsner, and it's yeah. like, um, I think that is like one thing for me that whenever we go places, if they don't have you know either an IPA or a pilsner, of it being like <clears throat> really enjoyable. Mm-hmm. So I like I didn't know about the artisanness that was craft beer until I went to Seven Seas either, mm-hmm. and I think I know <clears throat> I learned a lot from Austin and different people, and like for me, like there weren't a lot of girls who were like super into knowing everything or knowing Mm -hmm. a lot more than just the tasting notes. So I did appreciate, like, I think that was one thing that like I knew I could go to you and be like, is like, what are you thinking about it? Like I loved like our tasting that when we did the sensory panel and stuff like that. And I think being able to like see your Instagram over the years to grow from that and like really like know that it's, it's not just a thing that, you're doing for money or whatever like Mm -hmm. you actually do enjoy it I think for Austin and I like we we enjoy beer we enjoy the the community that the the craft beer industry brings and like being able to have people that we've met with and cultivated friendships with outside of that has been kind of incredible that's such a big part of it outside of the beer itself it's the people yeah Yeah. that's what I mean I think that is why that we have drawn to this industry so mm-hmm. much is that it is a huge collective of creative, passionate, ambitious, and also I think kind of alienated or like people that stand out. I mean, people are very much, they are their own person. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a lot. I know there, this is, you know, it's, it's a hard issue and it's not something I'm skating over, but like there's been so many issues of sexism, racism, misogyny, gatekeeping, mm-hmm. all these things that, sure take a long time to get over and we in are in every industry but also of course yeah, 100%. the beer industry a hundred percent yeah in all of the world really yeah. and yeah. so i think it's hard but i think that is one thing that draws us you see these people there where it's like i can thrive and be here and be myself yeah others are welcome as well and so i love that others are welcome yeah. as well yeah. i and think that is that is what the beer community is about. Yeah, yeah. and More I think acceptance. you've really you've really defined that. For those that don't know, um, she can plug this at the end. But uh, please follow Rachel at Beers in Bedtime on Instagram. You've done always a good job with. It's not just curation, but like your creative creativity with how you like. You're not just pouring a beer and showing it in the glass. You have. I would say costumes, um, the color matching, uh, the beer music, trivia, beer <laughs> trivia. You do such an engaging amount where it's like, oh wow! And you not only is it engaging and you learn something, but there are so many other. You could say there's so many other accounts. Maybe this sounds like I'm putting it down. I'm really trying not to, but I think it's easy to get caught into algorithms where it's like, oh, just copy and paste and do the same thing, whereas do something that is unique to you. And I think that's what you've done really well for yourself is that Beers in Bedtime is unique to Beers in Bedtime for a long time. And I think that's why when after Seven Seas or while you were there, you transitioned into a role, you were you were lead serving and then you started running and that really took off because Seven Seas, I mean, working there, a we this was like, it wasn't new to Instagram, but like our Instagram was not nearly as popular as like, Fremont Brewing, Georgetown Brewing, Urban Family Brewing, like all these other breweries that seem to really get on the early train of like how to do social media well. And I I speak for myself. I wouldn't speak for Seven Seas Brewing, but I think they were obtuse to thinking that like that doesn't drive in business when it really did. Because that's also, I would say like six, 2016, 2017 is when the peak of like 
portrayed on forums and big hype breweries. Holy Mountain is one that we all know in Washington mm-hmm. State, um, mm-hmm. whereas like the the their all, their merch sold out super quickly. Um, the all their, releases, yeah, all, yeah. all yeah. their online marketing was so well. That was yeah. something that you did really well. So I want to let you speak on that, and I'll quit talking. But like you did a great <laughs> job for Seven Seas uh, on that. So can you give us a little bit of that experience? Sure. Um, I think that. I had already had my beers in in Bedtime Account when I had started. I had been at Seven Seas for a little while, but they had already had a social media person. And I think that um, once I'd started in the tap room for a little while, I think that I had thought about this would be really cool to be able to use social media for them. But you could make it better. Yeah, I just, I felt like I had ideas and I had, um, I, I think that when you have your own account, that you want to grow, but you want it to be your own. Like, I switched my my Beers and Bedtime account to a business account okay. fairly early on. I did That wasn't my original goal, but then I saw it growing, and I was like, okay, well, I want to see. I want to, once that was available on Instagram, and then I was like, well, I want to see what the analytics are and and kind of understand a little bit more of it. And so I had already kind of digging in, uh, dug into the backside okay. of social media bit and I was like okay this is what's working and this is what's not and I had even sort of tweaked my own social media presence on the way that I was posting things and being more front facing and stuff like that in my social media because I found more interaction that way and so I was like I have these ideas that I've tested and tried on my Mm -hmm. own account that I think that I could implement and once you're working at a place for a while, then you kind of get like more of their voicing and their brand identity. Yeah. And I think that's um, obviously that's an important when it's not your own account because you you can't take over someone else a business account and then be your voice. Yeah, kind of like not, run it how you'd run your own yeah, personally. Yeah, yeah. You want it to be authentic, but you want it to be authentic for for the people that are you know for their business. And so I felt like at that. I had been there long enough to kind of understand yeah. what was important and true and what was the identity of um, Seven Seas to a degree. So it was really, really fun to be able to kind of take off with that and do creative things that w- it was a different way to be creative yeah. instead of this is what I think would be really cool. This is what I think Seven Seas fans will think is really cool and be in like that realm of things and, you know, tie things into, you know, nature and the water and, you know, things that are kind of Gig Harbor and Tacoma and things about the bridge that bridge, you know, our two places together, Tacoma and Gig Harbor, where the Mm -hmm. tap rooms are. And, um, you know, and then we did the bridge series. And so all those things kind of like tied in and it was really fun. I loved how, um, kind of outdoorsy I felt like it could be because that's part of my personality and things that I enjoy doing. So it was like, okay, well, I'm going to go take a hike or I'm camping or I'm kayaking. I'm going to bring some Seven Seas beers and I'm going to do these posts. And um, it was also like figuring out all the hashtags and what are the captions and what is – it was really my like first time – doing it as like a part of my career yeah. and figuring out like how to differentiate it from mm-hmm. my own account to make it theirs. Yeah. I think that was super fun and creative. Yeah. Yeah. I will, I will say you also on your account, you always were doing stuff outside, which I think mm-hmm. is very like, I wouldn't say true to tradition, but anybody that's grown up in the state, mm-hmm. there's no way that you can't go outside, take photos of it. And if you have food or bevy, you're going to take photos yeah. of that too. Yeah. <laughs> um, would you say, cause I think when around that time for what I feel like, which was, I think was like 2016, 2017, a lot of breweries were doing a lot of the same old sort of like online marketing techniques, especially through social media, which was at that point, just Instagram. Mm-hmm. Um, did you feel like that was, I wouldn't say rudimentary, but it was like very basic as opposed to like what you could actually do because from my perception, it went from doing the same things like I can't remember who was a social media marketer at Seven Seas at that time, and it's not any bad mouthing on them, but I feel like they were copying and doing the similar things that other breweries were doing, which wasn't getting much engagement. It was just basically copying and following the status quo, whereas you really 
worked hard and elevated it to do the things that like the breweries that were gaining a lot of attention to do. Do you feel that that like there was some sort of staleness? Um, mm. I, I, you don't. I guess maybe that's I'm not trying to put know you on the side. There's any like stats? Like, do you remember like the growth that you helped accomplish? Yeah, that was good. Too. I wrote those things down. <laughs> Yeah, I wrote them down when I took over the account. Then I, I, I will say the engagement flew up because it, I it remember really, the it definitely grew. Seven C's went from so many followers to then being up in the tens of thousands. I mean, they now I think it's around fourteen thousand that they have. Yeah, for mm-hmm. the Seven C's mm-hmm. Instagram page. I wish that I could remember now what it was originally at. I think that um, I think that I just have I don't know. I don't know what worked or what didn't no, work okay. or why it was different. Besides, I think I was trying to specifically pose more open-ended questions to elicit more engagement, and I think it was posting and at, and having stories on a more regular basis. And I think, um, I don't know. I think that I just had a different take on it. That was things that I loved doing, uh, and that I love beer, and I love the Pacific Northwest, and I don't know if maybe some of those things resonated differently with people. I mean, it obviously. I think it worked really well. I think mm-hmm. it was. I think it definitely. Um, I think it showed. I don't know. I think I look at it as like it went from corporate to feeling like it was a neighbor. That could mm. talk and engage mm, with you, that's good. which is mm-hmm. I think great, and I think that can yeah. be really hard for a lot of businesses. Um, bring the genuineness, yeah, Aww. and you, have you also and it, it was and it was too. It was very much so. Rachel beers in bedtime, like that never left. I think a lot of people knew because you obviously there was regulars that came to see you. I mean, just like any other good tap room and brewery. You have regulars that come to see certain servers and certain people, yeah. and people already knew your online presence. And I think you, I won't say you you talked about it, but I think people started seeing that like your personal posting on beers at bedtime, and then Seven C is people connected the dots, being mm-hmm. like, "Oh, this is really similar." Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, she because eventually you got the title, mm-hmm. uh, you got the title of like I'm now running Seven C's social media, and which was great because then that propelled you. To do not only your own thing, but your next job, which was another big brewery. I won't spoil yeah. it. I'll have you talk about it. But I do love this brewery, Ridge Top Red. Um, they had, uh, I think, Panther Porter. Yeah, I uh, think it was Black. Well, or maybe it was just Panther Porter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember the lo- uh, when I was serving at Spiro's, we would have Ridge Top Red and the Panther Porter. And then they had um, a beer for like the firefighters. It had like a fire ladder with like it a helmet was and St. Floridian. St. Floridian. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. It was but, a fundraiser for the for the Yeah, fundraiser. but yeah. so talk about this uh, next brewery that from yeah. Seven Seas launched you into. Okay, so I was at Seven Seas for about three years. I was short a couple of months or three years. And then. Um, we'll just I, call it three because you we'll probably worked three. plenty of days. That <laughs> sure. Counted into we, can, we can call it three. I yeah. did. I, I don't. I served a full three there. <laughs> exactly. I don't think anybody, if they're like, I was like two years and eight months, I think people yeah. just go, it's three years. Yeah, it was like, it was two years and three and nine months <laughs> is what it was. So yeah, it's like, yeah. So I can call it three years. I'm like, well, I didn't actually do that. Um, yeah. So I did that. And then, uh, and I had a couple friends at Silver City that knew that they were looking for a new social media person. And I had a little insight that they'd been tossing my name around. Nice. And so I was like, oh, they're, they saw me. Mm-hmm. So I reached out and got an interview and then and then went over and started my career. Because at, um, at Seven Seas, I was doing mostly social media, but I was still serving a couple of days a week, which I absolutely still, still enjoyed. Yeah. Um, but being a mom... Well, younger kids and paying for babysitters every single time I was working yeah. absolutely cuts into a lot of pay. It basically and negates at your tips. Yeah. It, it Well, what it did is it negated all of my hourly pay. I had zero hourly pay the entire time I was working at Seven Seas because all of that went straight to my babysitter. 
Yeah, all of that plus the taxes for that went to my babysitter. Yeah. So I was only working for tips the whole the whole time unless my kids were in school for part of my shift. You should and just you do were, what every parent does is just bring your kids to Seven Seas. I would have. Free babysitting and drunk parenting. <laughs> Not that you'd be drinking because you're working. I would Sorry. have been drinking. That's no, a, it would have been so that's just annoying. A, that's just a funny joke. You know, everybody knows the it. people in the yeah, tap room. Yeah, family-friendly oh, tap family rooms tap room. eventually yeah. will turn into yeah. drunk babysitting. As so a if mom, you, if you I don't have, want a mom. Other kids Yeah. While if, I'm at work. if you have a problem with <laughs> babies running around your tap room and drunk parents, just impose a $30 fee every single hour. Yeah. I have said this for a long time, yeah. but it's a baby it's a, sitting. It's a great qualifier. It negates everything. Yeah. If, if they're okay with it, you just tack on 30 bucks to their tab every single hour. But yeah, Can we sorry. Do that? No, I, I don't know, I but I think we should. I think we should. But I think it should be done thing. with done with the little bit. So, yeah, no, okay. so, so seven, I went over to Silver City noticed you. Yeah, so Silver City noticed me, which felt great. Um, I went over and interviewed with them and started a full time position doing just social media for them and no serving. And it was really, really cool to be able to be completely focused like on that and have it um I don't know, it was just a different experience. I had a marketing person also, so it was it was cool to be able to collaborate and build off of some things that were kind of already set into place. Um, and there was a studio room, and I mean, they just... Oh, awesome. It was a really nice upgraded setup and um, a real cool focus, and they were very much open to me doing, like, coming up with my own programs and figuring out some things. Um, Did it feel a little more professional? It felt really, it felt extremely professional, honestly. I was really impressed with, uh, you know, it felt... It felt corporate without feeling corporate. It felt like, oh, you have all these systems in place, but it's still yeah. a cool atmosphere to be in. And, um, and you know, on the flip side, like, their um, their sensory program was, like, a super, super. Yeah, it's top-notch over there. Super, super yeah. professionally run. Enid that's over it's there. It's, like, 20, 30 people. You, yeah. they, they do different rounds. They're doing, yeah, like, everyone. Intense. Everyone it ha is invited to come over. They have an app for it that you're putting mm -hmm. in everything in and they're doing things on you know a four to five day a week basis that you're coming over and whenever you get a chance you know they have stuff in like a you know the um, metal growl you know the steel growlers and stuff yeah. and then you pour a little bit and you're you know it's sensory tasting on ev almost every single batch that comes out yeah what what is it these are the keynotes that we consider this beer to be and are you tasting anything out of these key notes? And, and what are those things? And yeah. how close do you think that that is to that? And and then a bunch of, like, R&D on, um, on new things. And what do we think is – there's a lot of uh, – there's just a lot of input um, mm -hmm. from employees. Which is great. You, mm -hmm. you, you cannot have enough input. And yeah. This is not trying to overwrite your words, but, like, key notes or true to standard is, like, what a lot of breweries will say mm -hmm. for – Sensory panels because they they say is it true to standard for yeah. what the company wants? Yeah. Um. So if people listen, don't get confused by that. It's the exact same thing. Yes. It's all for value. Well, I mean, it shows. I mean, what year did they win? Mid that size? was the 2019? 2019. It was yeah. the year before COVID? I went over there. Yeah, yeah. It was. Yeah. It was the year before COVID. Mid size brewery. Yeah. Mid size. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And they've been. I mean, I mean they, it shows. They do great. I mean. Yeah, uh, Tropic Haze was a big kickoff for them, and I think that's when you were mm -hmm. working too, because yeah. they had already, they had already had um, what I felt were like fun, good social media campaigns, like the Ziggy Zoggy, their mm -hmm. summer ale, which was like the trout and the eagle mm -hmm. fighting. That yep. was always a fun one. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it, so I'll let you talk about it. But it's like when you went over, I feel like again, it's like you just continued to bolster. The growth and like what these companies do. So could you know you don't have to talk about long about it. Just explain your your little bit of experience there. Sure. Um, I think that it was cool because I there obviously had some like cool things already in the works, um, but they were also so open to employee input and stuff. And so some of the things that they had started was silver linings, which was their. Um, like benefit program, so like it was like community community collaboration things to raise money for certain programs in the community, and all employees were able to um, 
like nominate some some type of partnership that they thought that would be uh, beneficial or that they wanted to have a benefit beer for in okay, the community. Okay, like a charity? Yeah, like yeah, so okay. it's all like charity and That's very cool. um and all of it is, you know, whatever the profit is off of that goes to the um the local community thing and so we had done I had suggested um pride and so we did uh pride um we ended up doing a pride seltzer um, we also did a Humane Society beer, and then every year they do Pink Boot Society stuff, okay. which all of the females, every female in the whole entire company is able to go and brew and be paid for that that day, um, which is super cool. And we all oh, yeah. collaborated on what it was that we wanted that beer to be. Like, uh, we would get the, uh, whatever the hop selection for that, for, uh, from Yakima uh, hops and stuff. And we'd, yeah, for like the pink boots. Or yeah, for she their brew. specific yeah. blend. Mm-hmm. And then we'd be like, okay, this is what that's like. What do we think will go with that? And what do we want to brew? Um, and so that was super cool to be able to just collaborate with other women that nice. are super into beer and Absolutely. excited to be there and part of it and feel like we get a say for something that's just for us, which is cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think there was You're a lot of You're not just used that. for, you know, like visual or... Yeah, it's like, oh, well, we got some women brewers in here. You yeah. know, it, it, it's just a photo op thing. There was a lot, for one, I had never seen any female brewers on the on the backside for seven, seven seas, ever. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I don't think that there has ever been. I could be oh. wrong in the last year or two, but, but Silver City has had a lot, and you know, and there can be reasons for things and whatever that is. Yeah. But the proof is in the pudding. And when you're employing female after after female in the brewery, that does say something. And it says something to the employees that aren't in the brewery, too. Like, that you are seen as equal and that we are all doing all the same things and you can do any of these things. And um, so that's a different a different thing. But then uh, we also came up with um, a thing called Fem Ferment, um, yes. Which was so, so cool. Fun. It was which so is fun. so cool. I like yeah, I'm super The name super, too is so yeah. good. Them ferments. Them ferment. And it was a it was really a female home brewing club for education for brewing for women in the Silverdale, Bremerton, Pierce County plus mm-hmm. area. Um, with a whole program from start to finish of how to brew. We had some awesome uh, people come in. We had um, Seattle Beer School ladies come in that are so yeah, freaking they're rad. rad. They're so rad. rad. They're so cool. We had, um, yeah, we just, we had people from um, Imperial Yeast. We had people from Crosby, Hawk. Um, some awesome, so a lot of women in those, you know, in the hop industry, in the yeast industry, you know, and all of those things that are all, you know, uh, all part of the beer industry um, come and teach and give goodie bags, and we, um, well, I contacted a bunch of different places to send, they sent hops and yeast and yeah. all kinds of stuff um, for all the ladies there, and it was just a, it was a really cool thing to be able to experience with all of those other women being female-led, leading women into, like, really getting beer nerdy and just geeking out on you beer. You all enjoy yeah. the same thing. It, yeah. It's like a really big deal to have programs that show similar to the people that are similar to you. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm a I'm a white male, been in the beer industry for 10 years. There's no shortage of this yeah, yeah. in there. And, um, you know, I maybe watch it from the outside, but I've always been a person about, I will, I will tout this, and I can have other people talk about it, but, like, I've always touted inclusivity and wanting to have more... Um, I think openness and equality in the beer industry since I started. Yeah. And um, it is really empowering when you're able to have those events and they're needed. Um, Representation. Uh, Representation I'm for sad every I color it. for women. I'm like, can yeah. we do it again? Can yeah. Go? I know. Well, I would, I, that would be a dream. It, I will say it was, I think what was, what could be taught better in the future years is like, so when I, when I started, it was, when these events would happen, like all like she brew and all women brew days, there was plenty of male figures in this industry that we were told to look up to and were prominent. They were like, "Oh, this is just a gimmick. Like this is just a day for them. We just need to make them feel important." Not, I did not at all believe that, and I'm not just saying that to make face. It was 
never grew up like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was, it's really important to have representation. And now I'm glad that even though it's still a long ways to go and there's a lot of hard work to do, that there's so much more representation in doing mm -hmm. these things because you, you, you cultivate and create such a better diverse environment and also fantastic intellectual people mm -hmm. that would otherwise be turned off. It was just gate kept by one segment Absolute of people. Diversity absolutely makes beer better. Yeah. It makes beer better. Having people from different backgrounds, from with different ideas, challenging different thoughts and mm. flavors and all of it. Absolute challenge makes everything better. It does when you can it, it makes you smooth things out and you figure it all out and you come out with a better product. Yeah. And and that should be sought out and celebrated. And yeah. At all times. Mm -hmm. Women are the ones going mostly to the grocery stores to buy those grocery store that beers. Is true. <laughs> yeah. Very yeah, true. That so, is true. Or mm -hmm. like, you know, so I think it's not like you're not just selling a product to mm -hmm. this certain population. Mm -hmm. So like why would you not have those people a part of um that process and whatnot? And I think for me, like I I mean, this is a whole nother story, but like me getting into my craft beer world and the things that I know now and moving forward and like Austin reading the you know history of beer and knowing that like it started with the women, women. and like I was yep. just like I think I for me like it's just so exciting and I think I know for Austin and I both like the connections and the community is a huge thing for us and I think um, I don't know. I think it was really cool that, like, in the first brewery that I worked at. But, like, I think that was, like, such an amazing thing for me, the first brewery that I worked at, like, to have someone who was, like, so invested in, like, knowing beer things. And, like, I was learning a lot from Austin because I was interested in him. But, like, still, like, I didn't know that much as a... Sometimes that's how things go. And you're like, I'm interested. And then you're uh, like, but now I'm but now interested I actually just because know. I am. Yeah. And I think yeah. I I do downplay myself sometimes, but there's like I do know I do know things. And you like, do know things. I downplay. I think we all do. I think mm -hmm. some people just have a lot of bravado. Yeah. I yeah. think I question my knowledge all the time, and then I talk to other people, and I'm like, I do I know, know things. things. And you have yeah. done things. Your intro. Oh my god! Like, yeah. come yeah. on. And we've talked about this a lot off camera, and I've talked about it with a lot of other people in this industry who are prominent award-winning brewers, but the, the craft beer industry, I think, has created a very, like, toxic work culture where there's only certain people to listen to that have value and are important. Mm -hmm. And even though other people, like the majority of people say, like, no, that's not true, when it comes down to brass tacks um, and politicking in mm -hmm. craft beer, which it, that can make or break your career, it's really easy to get blacklisted by people that don't like you. Um it is really dangerous, and mm -hmm. we, we do keep a lot of that out. And that's something that um, I know from running uh, teams and managing teams in production and somewhat corporate facilities where, you know, these people, they, they want to brew, and they start off doing, like, kegging and production work. And it's like the bottom of the barrel stuff where it's like you're washing kegs, you are packaging all the time. Um, they feel like they're never going to make it. And then the people up above them that they want to be like say those exact same things where it's like, oh, yeah, dude, you're not smart enough to be a brewer or a sellerman. Like, you can't do these things. So that not only perpetuates just mm. on the brewery side, but also for people it's like, oh, you've never brewed? Well, we don't need to listen to the things you say. And this is where we're seeing all this is not only just misinformation, but it's been hugely toxic to this industry. It's eroded and created major problems. And also shunned a ton of people away that I think of, like, these people could have done amazing things, but they had such negative experiences that they never want to come back to this industry. Yeah. And that probably happens everywhere, whether it's teaching, music, um, working at grocery stores. If you're really passionate about somebody, something, and but somebody makes it so painful for you to be there that you never want to come back to it, you may have lost you know, somebody who could do the next big thing or create, you know, and I think it's just overall, I think it's something that the craft beer industry has a long way uh, to go on and to fix. And that's something, unfortunately, that minorities and females have been subjected to mm -hmm. the most over years. I would say 
yeah. if I may no, add to that. Thing. Of course. So I really, would, but really yeah. quick, yeah. I'm forgetting the name, but there, I think it's called Brew Revolution. It is a book. It was written in the early 2000s. It talks about how the only reason we have beer is because of women. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have a copy of it. Um, I can edit this podcast and give you the correct name. It's a great book to read. Literally, the only reason that we have beer in the world is because of women. It was given – once they say given to women. Women figured it out. It was held as a household task, and it wasn't until you know English monarchs and the huge church movement of like the medieval ages where they decided to profit and tax it, and they took it away from women. Uh, they said, you're no longer able to do this. We're going to steal your secrets. We, we want to make, make money off of it. Yeah. We don't want to pay you for it. And it, it yeah. Um, so, Lily, like, for everybody out there, please read this book. It is great. And it also just shows you, it's like, yeah, you know, everything that you once were told is flipped upside down, and there's no need to behave that way. But and what an interesting world if it hadn't been taken away from women. And if women had been able to make money and it had been able to take some. You know, take that uh, money to be able to figure out what it, the there, independence. There are some for remote tribes where the women make the alcohol, and they don't have any money. But then the tribe, the male tribe members, they pay them money for alcohol, and that is really how the system works. And the women hold all the power, which is <laughs> genius. Not really great, but it like breaks it. Freaking genius. Can you just imagine, Rachel? I'm just, I'm sorry. I'm singling Rachel out. No, 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 Rachel, can you just imagine I if can. all <laughs> of us women that wanted to homebrew just started homebrewing? And we just took over the just world. Took over. Yes, take with our homebrewing. Yeah. Power away. But well, or just like. <laughs> Gain some power <laughs> back and like share it. Yeah, or no, yeah, we should take like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, equality. <laughs> equality. Let's be equal. I, I, that is I really think the goal. As long as I get to drink it, that all the sounds good to me. The goal is really to I'm be like, equal. I don't know. I'm just for here. real. I'm like, what if yeah. we were like able to do homebrew kits for moms who were on a budget so they could mm-hmm. brew the really good homebrew? Yeah. And they didn't have to worry about their yeah. grocery store beer. They're like, hey, I'm making this delicious beer at home. I'm making this beer at home. Okay. I'm all for it. I love it. So all the things that you did at Silver City from, even though I have goldfish brain, um, <laughs> Fem Ferment. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Goldfish yeah, yeah. brain, Fem Ferment, um, the social media engagement, and the bolstering of what you did for Silver City, and also being included, I think, in a company that, Probably for the first time, maybe that you had experienced that actively engaged minorities, but also the female participants in the company to do so. That's something that you've really embodied in your own line of work outside of that, which if you want to talk about that more, but I feel like you were working at Silver City and then we're starting to do your own kind of consulting social media management and then eventually leaving Silver City you full-blown went into your own social media consulting company. So if you could talk about that, yeah, I'm all for it. Yes, absolutely. So when my time was winding down at Silver City, um, probably even before that, I had kind of thought about doing my own um, social media kind of contract business and thinking about being able to help really, really kind of just seeing a need kind of in the area for mm-hmm. smaller breweries and needing a bit of a more professional appearance. Yeah, which um, is a lot of. Which there you is a lot You probably know a lot about that, but Jules and I also, look at it all the dabbling. time. You guys know it. Yeah, yeah, I know a lot more in the Pacific Northwest. Obviously, I have um, a unique position with my Instagram account and being connected with a lot of breweries like all over the U.S., but you guys live in a cool van and get to travel all over the places and actually get to see these places and yeah. experience even more. And there are so many of the smaller breweries that absolutely do not have a budget for a full-time social media marketing oh, person. And they just need a little bit of help. And so my thought was that I I really, really want to see places succeed. I'm really excited about local beer people don't make breweries unless they're passionate about what it is that they're doing and they're really excited about it. And I do want to see places succeed. Um, I know that to some degree the product is going to kind of weed itself out in places and 
you know, you have a good product and people are going to come, but there are, it, there's so much more to a successful business than you can have a pretty good product and you can have a great product. And if you aren't marketing it well, then sometimes it's still not going to succeed. And that's a really, really sad thing. Um, yeah. So at that time, yeah, I was kind of transitioning out of Silver City. Um, I spent a little bit of time at a marketing company in Tacoma. And that was a really, really cool time to manage multiple accounts all at the same time and kind of get a idea of what that was like because I had only managed, you know, my own personal account, which you can put on the, you know, on the back burner when you're doing yeah. something else full time. And so um, being in a position to manage and navigate 10 accounts all at the same time that you're posting for wow. everything and doing all of that stuff. And it was a crazy grind. It was a, it was a lot, a lot of hustle to do that, but it was also so much planning and to some degree, my brain like loves, um, the fine tuning planning. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think that it, you know, without me realizing it, it set me up it, to be in a better position to offer services to multiple companies and understand how to manage multiple things yeah. at the same time. And I can when, see that. Yeah. When you're not doing it in-house full time, it is different. And it's, you're not getting the same, it's not going to be the same results. If you're paying somebody a full salary or you're paying somebody, you know, so much per month, it's a, it's a different result, but it is absolutely, people are so visual. Every, so I, when I am looking at breweries to go to, I am not looking on Google. I am going on Instagram, really. I want to see what it is that they're posting. I want to see if it looks professional. If the pictures look clean and professional and inviting, Absolutely. I'm going to think that that is the quality that of That does more than a review will. No. When you have that much attention to detail in the product that you're putting out, and then you have no attention to detail in the way that you market it, it looks like the like the product is not going to be good. It is a total package. People yeah. are visual and they do want to see that. And people also want to see what does the tap room look like? What do you normally have on tap? They want to get some type of brand identity. And so for these companies that are posting, you know, um, poster after poster or the same graphic over and over again, it's just it's not engaging to get that information out. And I can tell you a better way to do it. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> it makes easy. me so sad because I just want to do something for them. Yeah. I want to help them. It's, it's easy and outdated. Yeah. Um, I looked this up when I was working at Belmont Station. It takes the customer three to five seconds to figure out visually what they want to buy. It's so, quick on labels. It's quick when you're scrolling. Exactly. You like, have to do something different. Like you said, like if your Instagram page for your business has good shots, it looks engaging, it's not the same thing over and over mm -hmm. again, you will definitely get more people going to that than if it is just a bland, like, half-blind shot of tater tots and a burger with yeah. a dirty glass with a beer. Yes. Like, it shows. And it's also, like, the lack of care. People people now in this day and age also know it's like, if you have the lack of care to take that photo, what yeah. is your lack of care for the quality of your beer, the quality of your food, the quality of your – like That like you said, is the total assumption. Package. That uh, is. We, whether we realize that or not, that's what our brain is making, a snapshot decision of, and it does make a difference. And yep. beer, people that really love beer know that that is a, an attention detail process. Yep. And when you don't have attention to detail in all the other things, that is apparent. It's apparent yep. to me for people like me for sure. I mean, I know that you guys see things the same it's way. It's the same so way for us. When we're in a new place and we're looking at something, yeah, kind of on the we Instagram. find, yeah. we'll type in like breweries, we'll find them on Google Maps, and then we take the, that info from Google Maps, we plug it into Instagram, mm -hmm. and we see what pops up, yeah. what looks the cleanest, and it's like, boom, okay, this is where we're going. This yeah. is what we're doing. Yeah, I just, and now I just want to hear more about like your own company, like some of the things that you've seen and some of the things that you enjoy and like some next steps for you as well. Like, yeah, I see the passion that you have for the craft beer industry and then also to help them grow via social media. You've proven time and time again that you can help accounts grow on social media, but also translate to actual sales. So mm -hmm. like for yourself and your company, like 
What do you see? What have you been doing? What are you excited about? Well, part of, I think that, um, well, I started Social Karma Collective. Um, I, my goal is absolutely to hold, to help breweries kind of more specifically, but also I'm open to local businesses for people that I, you know, find, um, with adjacent, adjacent things. I mean, whatever it is. I think like similar interests. Similar interests, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think that no matter what it is that I manage, I want it to be something that I'm passionate about because I think that that the end result is a better result, mm-hmm. and I think that um, some people also have people doing social media that might not be passionate about that specific thing, and when it's not about beer, and beer is so specific and. Um, there's a lot of little things involved. If you don't have somebody that's in beer doing your social media and you're posting dirty glassware with bubbles all over it with the beer in it, some people really just do not know that. They also don't know how to describe the beer. There's just a lot of things, uh, little nuances, I think, that if you don't have somebody that's um, kind of more beer-centric, that you're going to miss a lot of things and that the people that are dialed in are going to see that. Mm-hmm. Your fans that are craft beer fans for a person that's managing an account that's not a craft beer person, I think some of those things do become apparent. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think that, uh, I think it only makes sense for all of us that we all excel at things that we are more passionate about. And so it makes sense to have the right person for the right job, for one. Um, But I think that having someone, um, I don't know, I think I'm just so passionate about the product and I love coming up with creative ideas. And so whether that's all on my own or whether that's something that I can brainstorm with an owner about and to see their vision, that is, that's what I want to do. Mm-hmm. I want to be able to, um, to make them successful and to make their brand look better and show off their product in the best way possible. Yeah, I think, yeah. You're, I think you're really good at uh, finding the details that – I think when running a business, it's easy to gloss over, but as business has been learning, and we've learned over the past five years that social media really does drive a lot of your business and brings in just people into your door. Mm-hmm. Keeping in there is a whole nother thing, yes. um, but you've shown through your resume and your history that time and time again, you are really fucking good at doing that. Thanks. I and, did. <laughs> and so I think it's been a pleasure to have you on, and I think for the last like minute or two of just talking about are there any other fun things, collaborations, or if you have personal projects going on, please sit there and plug that in. We appreciate you giving all this information to not only us, but people listening. So, Rachel, floor is yours. Thanks, you guys. You guys are awesome. Thanks for having me on again. Um, I think that I am excited to have some little bit extra focus on my beers and bedtime account and kind of doing I'm hoping in the next couple of months to have some kind of new and fun engaging ways I have some ideas up my sleeve um, for some kind of regular kind of programming including the trivia uh, beer trivia trivia things kind of kicking up and changing a little bit Um, but being much more consistent I think it's uh, I just moved in the last two months Well, I think for all of us, it's Mm -hmm. a transition time when you're December to January for all of our lives. And so kind of getting um, settled. Yeah. So I'm excited to kind of get things into a good routine for February. Um, I'm excited to hopefully partnership with some cool breweries. I also have some of my own side projects going on. I'll plug um, Beers and Playtime, which is an alternate social media account that um, kind of so- showcases a different side of myself and less beer and kind of more body positivity mm-hmm. and um, me just feeling like, um, you know, I don't really care about people's opinions as much anymore yeah. and about me just wanting to feel good in my own skin and finding ways that are creative for me uh, to express photography and art and myself, mm-hmm. and it's another side of me. And yeah. um, beer is a big part of my life, and obviously none of us are one-sided. Mm-hmm. We all have many yep. facets to ourselves, and um, and I don't think that it's shameful 
to be positive. I mean, I'm 43 years old, and I feel better in my skin now than I ever did, and I do want to celebrate that. And I, I'm not perfect, and I don't think that anybody needs to be perfect to, uh, to really like celebrate where they are. And I just, I want more of that for every person and every woman specifically. Yeah, I want them to be great. like, what fills your cup? Mm-hmm. What fills your cup? Don't be ashamed of it. Do what you want to do. You can be your own whole person. And the people that don't like it aren't the people that are in your yeah, life they don't anyway. Matter. Mm-hmm. They, don't, they matter. don't matter. And the older that I get, the more I just, I want that circle. Mm-hmm. And so 100%. fear, body positivity, friggin' cats, Amazing. cats. camping, <laughs> whatever it is that yeah. makes you have. Those are all the things that make me happy. Yep. My kids, all mm-hmm. the stuff. And I think that I'm a better, more whole person. I'm a better mother. Mm-hmm. All of those things. Sometimes you got to be a little bit selfish, and that mm-hmm. makes you a better person to do the things that fill Absolutely. your cup. That's what I want for all thank of us. Thank you. And to drink good beer. Good beer. Seriously, thank Cheers you. Cheers to that. It, also, shout is... out to all the rad women home brewers, or not home brewers, and Actually. professional brewers, mm-hmm. because, man, especially Portland and Oregon, they're freaking killing it. I oh, am so stoked absolutely. about all of these freaking logger houses with these killer female brewers, and it's just so inspiring. Yeah. yeah. And that's my Love last it. piece. Sorry. I'm just no, excited about it. I'm, Love we're it. all so here happy. for it. Yeah. Seriously. We, we will... We will plug everything that Rachel says. <laughs> yeah. Uh, her beers of bedtime, her social karma collective, that beers of playtime. It'll be yeah. on our social posts. Anything It'll be on the Spotify. Post, yeah. But um, we can't wait to have you on again. Yeah, I, I've There's talked like a lot. There's like a million more. But thank you. I'll let, I'll let I'll let Joel about. sign it off. I've talked a lot, but we're so happy to have met <laughs> <Yeah>. you. <laughs> thank you so much. I mean, we've known you now. I've known you now for almost six years, That's which so is crazy. wild. Yeah. Um. So who would have known that? craft beer would have brought us back together Aww. and has con- has kept us connected I think throughout all the years so thank you so much it's been such a pleasure to, to speak really with you and to hear your story it's been so, thank so you. fun and to celebrate you right. you've done yeah. some amazing things celebrate. okay we've already cried yeah. I've cried a couple times celebrate in episode one episode I, I, one I really can't think of a better episode yeah. than this yeah so. it's great thank you guys for letting me kick it off yeah. just the most hey, wonderful we'll, amazing we'll, humans when I we, when we come back on episode 100 it's gonna be a repeat with you <laughs> we'll see what's we'll going on easy. i'll yeah. be older and somewhere else silver hey, at, this, fox at or the something. rate that we're doing these <laughs> like it'll be in a year yeah that's gonna be great yeah. yeah yeah love it so much so thank you love it people cheers that's cheers. a that's a wrap <laughs>